se pensiamo che è stato diciamo, un sistema di scrittura credo, usato per sé ha caratterizzato la media in particolare componente importante del mondo antico diciamo così nel periodo delle cartaginese sia poi nelle province romane c'è cioè un'evoluzione molto complessa ma non devi lungo tempo su un argomento di cui abbiamo tutto da imparare I'm going to talk about, uh, so about the Lutko Berger script of uh, classical North Africa. Now, before the Roman conquest of Numidia, its inhabitants were already using a rather original consonantal alphabet to write their own language. We can, there's a lot of controversy on how early this practice began. So some, some, some people propose dates as early as 500 or even 800 BC. Some of us, but the, these early dates are not, but not all that well supported. The, the, there's only one inscription that can be securely dated, and uh, because it mentions it's a, a date within the reign of King Masinissa, and uh, it's, uh, it dates from 149 BC. Um, however, a number of uh, a number of bilingual texts prove that it continued to be used after the Roman conquest. Now there are over a thousand surviving inscriptions in this uh, Luko Berber script. And so most of them, the vast majority of these, seem to be funerary inscriptions for, from tombstones. From the tombstones. Now, however, particularly in the town of, uh, almost exclusively in the town of uh, Duga in Tunisia, there are also a number of uh, governmental official inscriptions so on uh, monuments. Now. Thanks to a dozen or so bilingual texts, we've been able to, uh, so to determine the sound values of the letters in this uh, writing system uh, since, uh, well, since, about eight, uh, since the 1840s, in fact, for a long time. But nonetheless, our knowledge of it remains rather limited. The Lutko Berber script is uh, attested in a very wide, uh, across a very wide area. You know, so on, there are some inscriptions that have been reported for the Canary Islands, all the way over here. And others have been reported as far as, uh, as far east as uh, Wed Giza in uh, Libya. I'm not sure exactly where that is on the map, somewhere around here. Um, so if we include these Sahara inscriptions, whose dating is more controversial, then we have an even wider range, all the way from Mauritania. Uh, to possibly as far east as, as uh, Western Egypt. Mm. However, these Sahara inscriptions can't really be dated adequately, and they may, they may be much more recent than the, uh, the, the, the inscriptions we're talking about. However, this wide range is somewhat deceptive. If we look at the, uh, so if we look at the main existing corpus of Libyan inscriptions, the Recueil des Inscriptions Libyques, we find that of 880 inscriptions in the main, in the main body of the text, over 800 come from just this one area, from the north, northeastern Algeria, northwestern Tunisia. Uh, so I'm, I'm not touching the coast, you, you might notice. Um, in fact, most of those come from even more restricted area, right around here, where the, which seems to have been the you know, the main center for the usage of this script in the classical period. And so the, this area of North Africa is also where practically all of, our, of the surviving bilingual texts come from. There's only about one exception, a, a, a short bilingual in Morocco. Um, so, in fact, for, during this talk and elsewhere, when I say that something holds true of Lipko Berber, what I really mean is that it holds true of the inscriptions of this area. The inscriptions of other areas are a lot more it's a, pose more complex problems. We don't we don't know that, we don't know for for sure that 
you know, exactly the same language was spoken here and in the Canary Islands, for example. And there's an, in fact, there's some, there's some reason to believe that, to believe that, that, there, that there were linguistic differences. There, there's some formula, for, for example, uh, that are well attested in this region, but not, out, uh, not outside of it. And there's some letters that are tested outside of this region, but not within it. However, the, the divergences should not be overestimated. But some of the commonest formulas found in this region are also used throughout the whole of the Gober area. So, 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 there's, so it's likely that, if not exactly the same language, they probably reflect variants of you know, close, close relatives. Mm. Okay, now the, uh, now the decipherment of this alphabet, of, the, of, this, of this alphabet, and of this language, relies crucially, initially almost entirely, on two bilingual inscriptions from the, from the town of Duga in Tunisia. Uh, so in, in, the corpus, uh, in the corpus I mentioned, there are corpus recognized by their, their numbering, RL1 and 2. Now then, as you can see, these, are, these have Lutko Berber on one part, and Phoenician, or so Punic, I should say, sorry, on the other, so on the other part. A little here, you've got Punic at the top, and Lutko Berber at the bottom. Uh, then, now, the, uh, so now, the longest of these inscriptions, in fact, the one that de Solsi made mostly based his inscription, based his cipher on in 1843, is, uh, this, uh, is this one. And as, and as you can see, it includes a very large number of proper names. The, uh, and so in, the, in this text, I've left the proper names unbolded, like Masinson for. This is in fact uh, Masinisa, um, uh, son of Gaia, Gaia, uh, Gaia, etc. Um, et cetera, as he loves, um, Mikusa, and that's Mikusa, um, right here. Um, so, since, uh, since Punic is well, uh, since, since the, since Punic is well understood, relatively well understood, uh, the, um, this made it possible to determine equi Punic equivalents for Lutko Berber characters, and hence approximate sound values for them. If you uh, go through this process, what you end up with is a chart something like this. Now, as a, now there, are there are a couple of uh, points that need commentary here. First, you'll notice that there are that for the single pubic letter is Zion, you have three set of distinct Lutko Berber equivalents. Obviously, we don't now we don't think that these were all pronounced the same way. We assume that they were so we assume that they were distinguished in one way or another, but it's really not very clear what the distinction was. Now, similarly, there are two variants of T. So there, sorry, there are two letters corresponding to T. Um, and, so, and uh, so, well, conversely, there's one Punic letter, this so-called H, corresponds to a whole range of Punic uh, governments, basically. Uh, 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 uh. Um, it seems, as we'll see later, it seems to have been a general marker of vowel status. Now, one of these letters, the P here, uh, is not actually deciphered on, is not actually included in any of these proper names. The, Q, the value of the for it is basically a guess based on comparison of the word in which it occurs to, uh, to modern verbal languages. So that one's not independently verified. Um, we should also note, you see that these uh, characters I've put at the bottom, these all occur in various, in, in various places in North African inscriptions, but haven't so far been tested in any of the bilingual texts, so we don't really have any idea of how they're read. There's some of the maybe variants of one another or of letters that we already know about, but we don't have enough data to be sure of that. Mm. Okay, now, 
Yeah, I should also point out that uh, that uh, this author, Shabu, um, Shabu so renders, considers these variants the same character. But some other authors distinguish this character, this letter from this letter. Mm. Okay. Now, it's generally thought that all the world's alphabetic writing systems, or almost all, derive from a common origin in, uh, so essentially in, in West Semitic. So, so, so and, in, and in particular, well, the, most of them seem to derive from a Phoenician transmission. The, um, now, Lipko Gerber contains enough letters that, cl that clearly resemble pu uh, Punic ones of identical value that, the, that, 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 that seems reasonable to conclude that, to, to conclude that it too shares a common origin. In particular, yeah, but I you know, point to uh, the G, to um, uh, to Z, to um, well, Sh and T. It's also look rather like Greek, of course, um, and uh, to the so-called uh, H and and Y. And so, however, I've tried to highlight in red some of the similarities that you can some of the uh, Possible similarities that you can see for other letters as well. These are more. These are going to be more, more controversial, more more controversial, more potentially subjective. Um, so how, this, however, it's not necessarily clear that Punic per se was the origin for this writing system. Uh, you'll, you'll, you know, those of you who are familiar with the so with Phoenician will know will know that some of these. Forms, in particular, the show seems to more closely resemble archaic Phoenician than it does the Punic variant given here. And uh, other authors, some authors have also pointed to resemblances with the with the Arabian family of alphabets, the so, you know, South Arabian and Thamud and so forth, which historically seems it would seem a little more puzzling. But uh, the comparison is uh, the, the comparison is possible. So we know. So, well, we can be pretty sure that so Lipko Berger fits into the alphabetic monogenesis theory, if you like. It's not quite so clear where it fits on the tree. And so, and um, so, it's also worth noting that the um, and so that this is clearly not simply a natural development of. Punic or Phoenician or any other alphabet that's tested. This is, and so what, what it looks like rather is, uh, is, a, is a conscious adaptation of such a script. <coughs> so for example, we have, we have at least one letter that seems to be clearly innovated. This uh, the first Z, the first Z doesn't seem to have any particularly strong correspondent in Punic, unless you regard it as somehow an inversion of the show. You have, the, uh, you have a clear reworking of the form of letters. So whereas Punic, throughout its history, shows a tendency to more and more flowing, more and more cursive uh, writing, in Lipko Berber, all of this has, uh, this has been, so that all these uh, curves have essentially been abolished and replaced strictly with straight lines, arcs, and 45 and 90 degree angles. And so, I mean, well, you know, one can argue that this makes card stone carving easier and so forth. But uh, at the same time, a lot of scripts have uh, so, so a lot of uh, scripts have been carved on stone, including Punic. So that's um, so that is so the extent the extent to which this is thoroughgoing, it, it, the extent to which this has been applied suggests some element of. Uh, Deliberate design, rather than rather than just natural change. The um, another clear another clear sign of um, a desire to differentiate the script is the direction of writing. Lipko Berber is uh, well. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's, it's uh, probably the only ancient script known whose normal default direction of writing is bottom to top. The um, and so the, the, there are a couple of exceptions. The inscriptions that we saw at Dukha, 
Uh, so, the, um, so the official descriptions is, um, are generally written with a, generally written right to left, like the like the Phoenician text. But the vast majority of the uh, surviving corpus is written from the bottom to top. Uh, so similarly, the Duga, well, the Duga text uses uh, word dividers, uh, dots to be exact. Uh, most Phoenician te uh, most uh, Lipko Berber texts seem to separate words simply by separating lines, which is uh, not which is which is a relatively unusual way of indicating word breaks. But um, and so now in, the, in, in such respects, I think the uh, the usage of Lipko Berber is so somewhat parallels its modern history, the history of its modern descendant uh, Neo Tifinau. It is, it's, uh, it's, in the, it's being deliberately distanced from its uh, well, common Mediterranean origins in order to emphasize a separate identity. But to some extent, as much as this must remain a matter of conjecture about more direct evidence. Now, Lipko Berber, like, uh, like Phoenician you know, so, and uh, other Western Asian scripts, quite strictly consonantal. In fact, it goes further than Phoenician insofar as it, it does not have a glottal stop and hence has no means of marking uh, even in, even word initial vowel, even the presence of an initial vowel. So in this inscription, you might notice um, been, uh, there are a couple of personal names that the Phoenician begin with a glottal stop. Afshan, Eshian, Ankikan, or whatever. And in the uh, Lutko Berber version, this wa means son of, that's uh, corresponding to modern Berber of. So, and you don't have any indication of the initial vowel, it's just o f shun, or o m p k n, o f shun, and so forth. The, um, yeah, so now, so the, this characteristic is actually shared with the, with the uh, with the most direct modern descendant of Lutko Berber, the Tifinel script used by the Twai uh, 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 Berbers of the Sahara. Uh, so it's somewhat ironic insofar as in Berber most masculine nouns start with a vowel, but the, but the modern Tifinel script of the Twai has no way of indicating that, and as far as we can tell, neither did ancient uh, Lutko Berber. However, there is one exception to the general principle of indicating consonants only. And this is the letter that shall we call H. Now, it's a, now as you can as you can see from these examples, you know, it sometimes seems to correspond to O, you know, Fausto, um, you know, Bahando, and so forth, and sometimes to E. So this is something like Namasi, you can assume, um, or Namasi or something. It's in, in general, it seems in, in general, however, this letter almost always appears word finally and seems to correspond to a vowel in the Punic or Latin transcription. It seems to be, so what it seems to be is an indicator of a word final vowel. As it happens, this is a, a method that shares with, uh, with uh, modern day Tuareg Tifinel as well. In uh, Tuareg Tifinel, the only vowel indicator is a dot that you can place at the word, uh, that you can place strictly at the end of the word to indicate the presence of the vowel. So, um, so, te so, te so technologically that makes sense, I suppose. But um, it's a, however, it's a, some people have actually seen this as a clue to the origins of Lipko Berber. Uh, Kerr, um, 2010, proposes that, you know, so it points out that in early Phoenician, no vowels were indicated, whereas in, so in Neo Punic, quite a lot of vowels were indicated, but in, in between, in Punic, you have, so you have a period where, according to him, only final vowels were, so were marked, thanks to the, because various, because various word final vowels and so forth had been, uh, had been lost, so, so where they became vowel indicators at the end of the word. And so, then, so, according, so he argues then that this characteristic so it must indicate the specifically Punic rather than Phoenician or Neo rather than Phoenician origin for Lutko Berber, and hence and this, and hence ties into the emergence of the kingdom of Masinissa and the, the rise of Numidia, basically. However, and so this um, 
this contradicts the dating that other that certain archaeologists, notably Gabriel Camps, uh, uh, has uh, proposed for, uh, for uh, some of the uh, some of the Moroccan Lubko Berber inscriptions, which uh, according to him date as early as 500 BC. Now, I'm not an archaeologist, I don't know anything about the field, so I can't judge the plausibility of that data. But I could, but I would point out that this scenario is equally compatible with one in which the Punic influence on a pre-existing pre Lubko, Lubko Berber script led to the led to the adoption of this H as a marker for word final vowels. Although complicating matters, this H seems to be attested in some of the early Moroccan inscriptions that are claimed to predate this. So, it's a, so in fact, we have a modern day parallel. In the, so recently, some of you might know that recently uh, Morocco adopted a variant of the Tifinel script as an, as an official writing system for Berber. So, um, however, this variant they adopted well, it takes the it, well it takes all the almost all its letter forms from earlier forms, the Tuareg, the Tifina, and Lunko Berber. Yes, so it adopts the uh, adopts right uh, principles based almost entirely on Latin scripts. It's written left to right with all vowels marked. It's, um, it's a you know a calc if you like on Latin this on the Latin script. So we could envision this as a kind of calc on Punic. So we don't really so. This won't really tell us what, where it originated, although the Numidian hypothesis must remain attractive. Mm -hmm. Now, the repetitive structure of the bilinguals so makes, it, uh, makes it possible to identify some words confidently, even without reference to cognates in any other language. For example, yeah, if, you, if, um, if you look at this, uh, this one, you'll notice that wherever you get bin, Son of, in the Punic text, you get a corresponding wo prefix in the uh, in the Libyan text, in, in the Lucco Berber text. And so we can say this. So we can say, and since this then recurs, you know, half a dozen times, we can confidently state that it corresponds to son of, that wo means son. Similarly, we've got an N that shows um, not in this text actually. There's an um, well, similarly, okay. Similarly, wherever you have hamemlekat in the uh, in the Punic text, you know, normally that would mean kingdom, but it seems to be used here in a sense that, that we can more easily interpret as king. Wherever you get hamemlekat in the Punic text, you get this gedet in the uh, in the Libyan text. So by you know by applying this procedure for a while, for a while. You end up with uh, so you can you end up with a, a small but usually but serviceable Lucco Berber vocabulary. The um, unfortunately, all the bilingual texts, the bilingual texts from which we can get most of the uh, words, RL one and two, are extremely non-typical of the uh, of the corpus. The um, they're both official inscriptions. Uh, listing listing things like titles and job functions and so forth, but most of the words of them don't appear in any of the inscriptions from any other town in Dubai. Most of them, because because most of the other inscriptions have a completely different theme. They're funerary inscriptions dealing with um, you know saying basically X son of Y lies here. Um, here's one of the more uh, here's one of the more ornate examples of the. Funerary inscriptions. It's a Latin, Latin uh, Libyan bilingual, as you can see. The Latin text here in this uh, inside the square says "Sactut," so son of the lived uh, seventy years. The Luca Berber text in, in rows, uh, in rows below it, says "Well, Sactut, son of Yeah, we can read that fine. And then something. Something, something, something. None of, the, none of these seem to mean, none of these appear to mean 70 years. I should put this point out. The, um, what, what you in fact get in, this, in, in pretty much all of the 
tombstone polygonals is you have a Latin or Punic inscription based on Latin or Punic models of what's supposed to go on grave. And then you have a Lipko Berber inscription based on Lipko Berber models of what's supposed to go on grave. It's not a literal translation by any means. Usually the only thing that's should that's shared is, is the name of the is the name of the deceased. Sometimes even the name of the deceased is not shared because the uh, because in Latin he uses a Roman name, but, uh, so, you know, Rufinus, for example, which uh, so which seems to correspond to something completely different in the Lipko Berber text. So when we have a number of funerary bilinguals, they aren't actually very much help. Mm. And most of them aren't nearly as horny as that one, as you can. This is a much more typical example. Just X, son of Y, this wolf is the son of a thing. And then you have some long thing here that's probably a tribal name, probably a title, but we don't know. Um, yeah, as a, another example. This one's actually somewhat unusual, that the Punic text is less specific than the Libid than the uh, Lipko Berber text. So, the, guy does, so you know, the, the author put together a nice epitaph for this guy and then decided to add on his name at the top in Punic without even bothering with his, uh, with his uh, patronym. But, yeah, I mean, probably, but what this mean, the vast majority you know, probably, less, probably something like 90% of the texts in the corpus are of this type. And these, uh, you know, and, and the common, there are a number of common words that are occurring these for things like rasa uh, or, well, to pardon me, meswa, minkada. And so, like, this meswa thing occurs all the time, minkada, and so forth. And none of these have any, and for none of these can be identified confidently in equivalent to bilingual texts. So the vast majority of the corpus consists of things that the, bilingual, that the bilinguals don't help us much with. The one thing that constantly occurs is this X son of Y, W, X, W, Y. Mm. Now, the obvious candidate, right from the start, for a language related to the Libra would be modern day now, the, the Berber languages are spoken across the vast areas of North Africa, as it is, as a, you know, but the Central Sahara, most of the mountains in Morocco, so several, several pockets in Algeria and in the Northern Sahara generally, and one pocket that's not on this map, in Mauritania. The, um, there's, there's, still, there's something like, something on the order of 25 million speakers of Berber at the moment. And uh, it's, a, it's a national language of Algeria, an official language of Morocco, a national language of Mali and Niger. Probably soon to be a national language of Libya, but that remains to be seen. Um, and so, now Berber, Berber belongs to the Afroasiatic family, along with the languages such as with uh, Semitic, but also Cushitic, Ancient Egyptian, uh, Chadic spoken in, 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 uh, around Nigeria. And, uh, so, and so, and um, well, Semitic, of course, Semitic, of course, you're all familiar with. This uh, including Hebrew, Arabic, and so forth. Now, you can provisionally divide Berber into about four. Berber was traditionally regarded as a single language, in, uh, but that really isn't true. There's, uh, in particular, so in particular, Western Berber, the family that includes uh, Mauritania and one small language of Niger is uh, has probably has probably has probably been separate from the rest of Berber for you know good for at least three thousand years. Um, provisionally you can we can divide Berber into four subgroups. There's the Western, basically Mauritania, nearly extinct. The Twaibek in the Central Sahara, Eastern Berber, which is basically two towns, Ladanus and Ojdam, also nearly also nearly extinct. Um, and a somewhat questionable large group called Northern Berber, which uh, consists of languages of South Central Morocco, Atlas, or Atlas Berber, Romada in Northern Morocco, uh, Kabi in North Central Algeria, and pretty much all the other Berber languages in a vast, in a, in a 
in uh, nor in uh, well, northeastern Morocco, a lot of uh, a lot of Algeria, and scattered pockets of uh, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. Is uh, so to avoid confusion, I call it macro Zanetti because Zanetti is also used to refer to a subgroup of this. Um, now, one thing you might notice from this map is that now the area where the main concentration of Libco Berber inscriptions was found there, no Berber language was spoken there anymore. In fact, yeah, the overwhelming majority of Libco Berber inscriptions comes from an area that at present speaks exclusively Arabic. So, we can, so, so we're not, we definitely can't assume that the surviving Libco Berber, that the surviving Berber languages are going to include any direct descendants of the language represented by Libco Berber. Um, however, from the from the two from the main, two main bilingual texts I mentioned, we can uh, see even even if we even excluding um, you know words whose Phoenician whose uh, Phoenician translation is problematic, whose Punic translation is problematic, we can get a reasonable vocabulary of uh, words that are independently known in Libco Berber with Punic equivalents and English equivalents here. Now the now, of these, you'll notice, you'll notice that you notice first of all that these show very little resemblance to Punic, with a couple, with two notable exceptions. This, um, well, Shufa, presumably for judge, uh, Suf, uh, I think it's, it's Latin, and uh, well, probably Omnai for Omnai placers or people who so who put who put this up. Um, now both of these are probably low words. In fact, so in fact they're also half acts of gone. I don't believe that. I don't think they occur in any of the other texts. So um, not that unusual. So if we exclude those and we try and look, try and compare these with some modern Berber languages, then we get this. Now you'll notice that and is exactly the same as Lucco Berber in all the, all the languages examined. Of again, its or his, uh, so the same to the same two of them, close to the same in the rest. Son of the same in almost all of them. Um, would, yeah, there's a sh question mark bar. I should say that that's the letter that was transcribed as, as Q previously. We don't really have any basis for transcribing as Q except this comparison. So to avoid prejudicing the issue, I'm putting a question mark here. And you notice that all the Berber, that all the Berber languages, so where it's tested, seems to seem to have, you know, a form of S in the beginning and R at the end. Iron, again, correspond with correspondences all over Berber. King, correspondences over most of Berber. In fact, uh, so in fact, pretty much every branch of Berber except Twedding has has this word for king, Egg It's reconstructable for Proto-Berber, and they built. It doesn't show up so clearly for this table, but it's tested in enough Berber languages from enough different regions, including Libya, Mauritania, and so forth, that we can safely reconstruct this verb, a uh, scout, for, for, for proto Berber. And the N, throughout Berber, is the marker of the third person plural. So that, so, so that works as well. So practically, so, so practically all of the, uh, of the words that we get from these from these two bilinguals have precise correspondence, have precise cognates in modern Berber and are reconstructable for proto Berber. The conclude, you know, the, um, on top of this, the, um, you, have, you have grammatical resemblances. So, for example, in general, of is it in these inscriptions seem to be translated with n, but with the word son of, where well, you, you get a direct connection of the uh, you know, son of plus the name. This same irregularity is true of all modern Berber languages as well. Wherever you get this, uh, this form of O or U, you, it's directly prefixed to a name instead of taking a, a gender particle N. Um, you have the third person plural N. You also have the, so you also have the, in this word, workers, you have what looks like 
a, this is a nominal plural n, corresponding, you know, corresponding to computer e, which again is uh, universal in Berber. Um, and uh, on the whole, it seems impossible, uh, you know, on, on the basis of these inscriptions alone, it seems impossible to doubt that Lipko Berber is in some sense a Berber language. But unfortunately, even though this is direct, now, even though this, these similarities have been known for well for well over a century, the uh, the, hypo the this hypothesis has not proved very helpful in deciphering the remaining in deciphering the remaining inscriptions. There's an, it is, there are a few words that have been plausibly deciphered based on on verbal comparisons. In particular, there's daughter. As a, well, there's a word "wilt," which occurs in a couple of inscriptions, which seems to correspond to modern Berber "wilt," "wilt," daughter. The word "met" occurs in one inscription that seems to be, that seems to correspond to "twedig met" to mother. There's um, there's the titles that we, the titles that we mentioned "Musna" or whatever for centurion. Um, well, it's translated in Punic as "master of the hundred." Um, well, master is not doing that one probably, but and so the um, and then this seems and so this is plausibly been linked to uh, to modern Berber and Musa, which literally means knower, and the semantic comparison that Delgado proposes is with Latin quasi. Um, and similarly, you've got the, uh, the common title. Um, hang on, where is it? Yeah, the common title. It's a, um, Minke, Minkeda, also, which, uh, as, uh, which, as pointed out by Shekhar, seems to correspond to the twig MNK, which means the person in front, and hence the leader. Um, the, this, uh, this, this comparison, this and the previous comparison, incidentally, give us a piece of, uh, of Lipko Berber verbal morphology, the prefix N, to form agent nouns from verbs. Which of course is well tested throughout Afroasiatic, so including Arabic and uh, Chai. Um, so I mean, it's, so this hypothesis has been somewhat fruitful, um, and, if, and uh, if you apply if you apply the if you compare the vocabulary to Berber, Berber modern Berber counterparts, you end up with Berber equivalents for some sixteen out of at least 22 out of at least 22 letters, which is not bad for a start. But still, the number of confidently deciphered words remains quite small, and a lot of the commonest words in the corpus, these funerary titles, or well, we assume they're titles, there is a remain of doubtful interpretation. This disappointing result is understandable in some ways. As the um, yeah, as, as Shek of uh, 1984 notes, there are several factors that make comparison difficult. You know, first of all, there's the distance both in time and in space. These inscriptions are more than 2,000 years ago, from more than 2,000 years ago, and also and um, and from a region that doesn't speak Berber. There's a um, there's the lack of any indication of vowel position or quality, which causes enormous ambiguity in attempting to find. Berber counterparts. There's the, 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 the yeah, and there's also there's also the problem that modern Berber languages are, are all quite heavily influenced by Arabic, and are most heavily influenced by Arabic precisely in the domains of politics and religion, where one would expect the the titles of appearing in these inscriptions to be drawn from. So a lot of them, so a lot of this vocabulary may simply have been lost without. So, Without, without any trace. However, the reconstruction of proto Berber and the uh, lexical data available on modern Berber languages have both advanced a long way in the past, uh, in the past 50 years. Re examining the inscriptions in the late of this doesn't really, doesn't, really solve, uh, doesn't really solve most of the problems, to be honest, but it does provide a new line of attack. Now, we can. Uh, in particular, there's a, a couple of so-called so laryngeals that have disappeared from most modern Berber languages, but can safely be reconstructed on the basis of comparison. 
And so that one of the and so one of these is the so-called V. Um, the, the, this, this sound is reflected as uh, H in Tweg, as V in two Libyan cities, and everywhere else it simply disappears, or you know, leaving behind all the vowel length. And so, um, now for now, a long-standing proposal, uh, the original shovel, identifies the common, the, the common formula of uh, bitus so as um, is often found on gravestones, as in these cases. These are, no, these are, these are these two examples, a couple more down here. Identifies this bitus as meaning his stone. We already have this suffix, this or this, for a stone. And in fact, we also have a comparable putative word and usage. It's a, a lot of putative gravestones. This is say something like uh, like start with something like Eben Ze, you know, this, Eben Ze, this stone. Which, um, so the comparison appears plausible. Now, if we look at modern Berber, the uh, then uh, we get then there are a lot of, of potential equivalents for the a lot of uh, cognates for this. Uh, so things like Tawunt, Tawunt, and so forth. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, Kossman, uh, 1999, reconstructs for Proto-Berber the form the Tavunt with a V. This, um, the, the T, I should say, the T is a feminine, the, the circumfix T is a feminine marker in Berber. And there's some reason to believe that the prefix, at least, is a post-classical development. So the, uh, so the root of this word is, is uh, Vun. Which, seem, which obviously seems comparable to this. If we accept this comparison, then that implies that the reflex of Proto-Berber V in Libyan was the letter that we transcribe as B. Now, since the vast majority of Berber languages have lost this sound, this, um, so in, now, now, so this, this, you know, this is, is a useful reminder that we can't necessarily compare it directly to uh, modern verbal forms. I need to, need to take into account dialect, uh, cross dialectic data in particular from the Libyan languages that preserve this sound. Now, uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting recent developments in the reconstruction of proto verbal is the discovery of, the, glob of the, the glottal stop. Basically, it turns out that one, one verbal language, the Zenega spoken, Zenega spoken more in has a phonemic plural stop that occurs only in code position. And, uh, it was, and uh, Kossman in 2001 discovered a regular correspondence between this and, and vowel quality in a Libyan Berber language, Adamus. Now, since there's absolutely no. Now, well, both the linguistic and historical grounds make it extremely unlikely that there's any closer relationship between. More Italian Berber and Libyan Berber. So this, so this, so this observation forces us to reconstruct the blob of stop for proto Berber. So we have a contrast, for example, e is reflected as in Odenis's O, whereas e is reflected as a. So, um, so now the interesting thing about this is that. One of the, the, the only verb, the, the only absolutely certainly attested verb in the Libgo verb corpus is they built, or scat or something. And, it, and that verb in proto verber had a had glottal stop, was get. So, this, uh, the, now this glottal stop is not, as far as we can tell, reflected in the, in the Libgo verber orthography. Despite the fact that Punic, that, you know, that, that, um, Punic still had at least the initial glottal stop to model, uh, to model themselves on, and despite the fact that Limco Berber consistently marks all the consonants and none of the vowels, as far as we can tell, except for the word final vowels. So, now it's difficult to be, it's been difficult to be certain about the orthographic conventions, but this strongly suggests that Limco Berber, like most modern Berber languages, had already lost the glottal stop. And uh, 
in particular, that would imply that Ludovico Berber could not be the ancestor of more Italian Berber. And so, and so, and uh, in other words, we cannot either we cannot identify Ludovico Berber with reconstructed proto. -Berber. It had already undergone some changes relative to that. Mm. Now. Now, there are also a couple of more speculative uh, possibilities. There's, um, sorry, one second. Yeah, in, in this inscription, the word, uh, this word, citizen death or whatever, there's, its interpretation is not entirely clear, but one proposal by the God identifies the first half of this. With um, so with the verbal word for year, which in Mauritanian verb would be as uh, that would be ashabash. And so as you can see in the, in the Punic text, you have shot in the year of. So this, well, by no means certain. This is a possible. This is a possible reading. If this is true, however, then it gives us another interesting proto-Berber correspondence. There's a there's a, a constant reconstructors. Geminate wo, wo. In the vast majority of verbal languages, because it becomes g, g or wo. How I, well, in uh, in Ojeda, in, in, in Libya, it becomes in one Libyan town, it becomes wo. And the only and in only one branch, um, Western verb, that is with more Italian town, it becomes b. So if this correspondence is accepted, then. We have a, then, we, then we have a suggestion that might group more closely with, with Western work. However, since we've already seen that it doesn't retain the plot of stock, well, more time with Berber does, I'd, rather, I'd personally rather take that as evidence against that interpretation of uh, this of uh, But the but the jury is still at this. The, this still needs to be investigated. We also have. Um, this word, uh, this word for king, which we uh, see, um, yeah, is a uh, gilbert. Now you know, you'll note that uses a g. Now in most of Berber, this sound, this sound, proto, proto reconstructed as g, is reflected as g. But in the the Znati branch, it's consistently reflected as j. So, um, so, so we can safely say that Libko Berber did not share the innovations of the Znati branch of Berber, which is, and so which is kind of interesting because the closest currently surviving Berber languages to the to the region we pointed out are in fact, in fact belong to the Znati branch. So, um, and conversely, we also have evidence for one distinction that. Libko Berber seems to make that is not reconstructable for Proto Berber. There's, um, now, some, now no, most, many modern Berber languages distinguish sir and z from sh and z. So, however, none of them seem to, uh, so, however, this, this re distinction is not reconstructable for Proto Berber. And in particular, there's, um, you know, all, all modern Berber languages. As you can see from this table, use the same consonant for its as s, and for wood s. But in Lipko Berber, we have what's clearly we have what's transcribed as two different consonants s here and sh here. So on the face of it, you know, it looks like we've got a phonemic distinction being made in Lipko Berber that, that's not made that, that that did not survive in Proto Berber. On the other hand. There is the so there is the possibility that this is an innovative distinction because, um, in particular, some and so the, in particular there's some evidence within Berber of the uh, so being back to show in next in the neighborhood in, when in clusters with a with a velar consonant. So of course of course if we accept that uh, if we accept that scenario then that means that the vowel that shows up here as well the f. Separated the sun and the blood, must already be lost, which would, which would lead us to group this more closely with northern Berber. So, um, 
And so, so either way, it's, and so either way, the information is relevant to subclassification, but we need more data to decide between them. And unless there's major archaeological discovery, we're not likely to get the data we need, unfortunately. So, so um, yeah. So the overall picture that we get is proto is uh, Luko Berber is definitely not proto Berber. It doesn't seem to belong with Western Berber or with Clay. And it, it seems and it seems that it seems closer, generally speaking, to Eastern and Northern Berber, which seems appropriate since those are the, since those two are the most are, are the branches of Berber spoken uh, nearest to it. But we could, but on current data, we can't place it any more precisely within the tree than that. Mm. In fact, we have some grammatical evidence for Libco Berber being distinctive, for, for Libco Berber being quite distinctive, which is the, the H suffix that shows. Now, here's the first uh, bilingual. This one was actually discovered in the 1600s. Um, now, you'll notice, now, you'll notice this, you know, this is where we get the words for wood and iron from. Or Yan puts in the Punic text. Now, as you can see from the comparative table, there's a, you know, this a, this H, this presumed final vowel, isn't reflected in, in uh, well, for, for firewood, it's not reflected in any of the Berber languages. For iron, it's there. There's a possible reflex in Tamasha, but the Tamasha, the Tamasha, the Twelfth form. Is actually irregular compared to the rest of the Berber forms, um, and may, I may reflect in, it may, may reflect influence from another root, the word for the root for coal, for antony, which is dazolt. So, you know, what this suggests is that we have some kind of, this, and this H suffix is actually quite common. We get it, you know, we've seen it, for example, on this, you know, menkeda or whatever, which corresponds to modern poetic anenke. Again, with no with no kind of vowel suffix to compare. So we have a little bit of a problem there. You know, you have this very common H suffix showing up in Libco Berber with absolutely no obvious correspondence in modern Berber. Now, Shekhov proposes to read this as a R and as the first person the plural possessive, our. Now that might work for the for this um, Menkeda title, for commander or whatever it is, but it's clearly not going to work in a con for the H in the, uh, you know, in wood here, for example. There's nothing in the context that would lead us to translate this as our wood, nor in the translation of it, in fact. Um, similarly, this is the Delgado's proposal to read this as a demonstrative, A suffers from the same problem. Why would you put a demonstrative on gatherers of wood? Or as a cargo's wood. So, you know, there, there are a couple of there are a couple of linguistically reasonable possibilities. One is that we're dealing with some kind of noun uh, noun marker. So, in the modern Berber, there is a common demonstrative ah. So maybe this demonstrative got grammaticalized somewhat as it has an Aramaic into just a marker of noun so of noun with no particular semantic significance. The other possibility is there might be a case suffix of some kind. In the uh, Libyan Berber has, pre has preserved a locative suffix e, the sort of on, uh, so on nouns. Now a locative suffix would obviously not be appropriate here, but if we imagine this is some kind of bleak case, then we might we might be able to account for it. But in that case, we again have something with virtually no a, a feature of Libco Berber grammar. Which has left virtually no surviving traces in modern verbal. So, let's say if this were true, it would correspond nicely to data from other Afroasiatic languages. But again, we desperately need more data to be able to test this. So, um, you know, it's, so it seems that we can safely conclude that the language of Lipko Berber inscriptions really is closer to Berber, closely related to. We can reasonably hope that the you know, ongoing process of reconstructing proto Berber and gathering more extensive lexical data will slowly cast more light on the existing materials. 
but there's, a, there's only so much you can, you can get from a corpus that consists almost entirely of short tombstones. And so the, um, there is still some hope of discovering new, longer inscriptions, uh, in particular a couple of inscriptions of, uh, that have been found in Dugga in recent years, by, by um, Sword of Ireland, for example. But for the moment, I, have, I, so I sadly have to say that, our, that in 1953, uh, Fivley concluded that we knew that, that we know the meanings of about ten words in the in, uh, Lutko Burke. We haven't gone, we haven't gotten very far since. So, thank you all for listening, and uh, I'll forward your comments. <laughs>